On today's show, we'll be talking about diversity in the workforce and the barriers that people of color encounter in their careers and in the job market in general. I am your host, Tawana Streeter, and today I have with me Melissa Donaldson, who is the Senior Vice President and Chief Diversity Officer at Wintrust Financial Corporation. And Melissa has been doing this phenomenal work for more than 16 years. Melissa, can you tell us a bit about yourself and why DEI? Absolutely. So, Tawana, first of all, thank you very much for having me today. I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you. And spend this time with you on this very important topic, uh, topic of conversation. Um, I like to say that DNI kind of found me. And, and by the way, I'm old school, so mm-hmm. forgive me if I don't e- e- DEI every single mm-hmm. time. <laughs> but um, DNI found me uh, because I have a mosaic of a background. Mm-hmm. So, my background spans many decades. And I've done everything from sales to uh, career consulting mm-hmm. to learning and development to um, professional services in the tech space. Mm-hmm. And I think ultimately where I kind of cut my teeth from a diversity and inclusion standpoint, I was not a practitioner. I was working at a tech firm mm-hmm. and I was being given opportunities to go and spend time with uh, the black executives of the firm. Uh, mm-hmm. And because my uh, office was not located in the headquarters, which was in Boston. I was in Dayton, Ohio. So it gave me an opportunity to kind of see folks that I never would have seen mm. otherwise. And looking back, I now see that 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 company had a formal diversity and inclusion practice. Wow. Back wow. then. Didn't have that name, but that's what it was. And and uh, I was a part of what we would now call a business resource group. Mm-hmm. And it was called the African Heritage Network. Ah, so that that was one element. And then uh, later on in my career, when I was in sales, I had moved to Chicago. So I moved to Chicago about 26 years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, my husband took a job. And and so uh, I was able to transfer with that tech firm. But then they sold to another firm. And, and then I transitioned into print sales, actually. Mm-hmm. My customer base was a lot of the um, public sector. Mm-hmm. Right. So, Mm. you know how it is, high volume, low margin kind Mm -hmm. of thing, no shade, but that's what it was. (laughs) It was a lot of work. (laughs) Um, And I recognized that they had a commitment to making sure that the organizations they did business with were also doing business with, you know, women and minority owned business. So underutilized businesses was kind of the term uh, back then. And so I recognized then that there is a revenue generation element. Wow. To diversity and, and inclusion. And this was 20 years ago? At, yes. Something we are just focusing on. Most companies are just focusing on. It is something, actually, you know, people don't recognize that DNI really has been around since mm-hmm. at least the 40s. Wow. Right? And so it's an offshoot. Uh, and I wouldn't even really say an offshoot. It is an evolution, if you mm-hmm. will, uh, from affirmative action mm-hmm. programming, mm-hmm. right? Which is a legal based. Uh, concept. Mm-hmm. And um, I know we want to talk more about that. But DNI, as I see it, really kind of got its legs in the late 80s, early 90s, when mm-hmm. there was uh, books coming out around Workforce 2000. Mm-hmm. You know, what is the workforce going to look, right. look like right. in the year 2000? And half of the women that you're going to be, half of the people that you're going to be interacting with is going to be a woman. Mm-hmm. You know, the managers are going to be women, right? And so we actually saw that phenomenon come to light earlier than 2000. And, you know, people having to recognize that there's all kinds of people who are making decisions and having influence in these organizations. So don't just, you know, speak to one part of the table, speak to the whole table. Exactly. Right. And so for me, um, you know, just kind of fast forward, it's always been this marrying of, you know, who we are as an organization how do we make money? What's our business? Mm-hmm. Who are we doing business with? And what is it going to take for us to be successful? And a large part of that is, you know, our greatest asset of all, mm-hmm. which is our people, mm-hmm. right? And what do they know? What do they know about how to be successful in the organization? And yes, what do they know about understanding what's important to uh, customer bases um, so that they could be successful as well? So I've done the work from a business to business standpoint as well as from a business to consumer standpoint. Mm-hmm. And so I've just really learned a lot. So my 16 plus years of doing this work, um, you know, at the highest levels in, in corporations uh, has just just simply means I've seen a lot. I've done a lot. <laughs> Continue right. to be a student of the work. Um, and, you know, in many ways, I, I just see it as a real uh 
you know, element of, of ministry, if you will, mm-hmm. in that I think about that in, yeah. in everything, yeah. you know, that I'm doing. And that's how I feel about coaching. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like that's a ministry, coaching and mentoring. I feel like that's my ministry. I love doing it. But you said something, awesome. you mentioned affirmative action. And I want to be clear when we talk about affirmative action and when we talk about um, DEI, there are two different things. Yes. So while affirmative action focuses on taking positive steps to get individuals into the organization, diversity in the workplace works to change the culture within. The people we work with, the people we work for, and the people we are providing products and services to. Mm-hmm. So I just wanted to be clear about that because I know there are people who are like, this DEI is just another affirmative action. Absolutely. And they are completely different. Can, can, I, can I speak to that Absolutely. a little bit? So, you know, a lot of people don't recognize that affirmative action really has its roots, you know, as, as a, a part of... Uh, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 mm-hmm. and Title VII, and it names a lot of sort of protected categories mm-hmm. around um, thou shalt not discriminate on right. the basis of, you know, race, sex, age, those kinds of things. Um, and prior to that, what was happening is, you know, labor and management have always had this, you know, sort mm-hmm. of interesting relationship, mm-hmm. right? And the reason why the... Um, the EEOC even felt need to come up with the affirmative action plan as a program, as an edict, Mm -hmm. is because there were just businesses who were literally pushing out blacks and women, uh, particularly after, uh, you know, soldiers were returning from Mm -hmm. World War II. They were pushing people out so that, frankly, white males could get more jobs, Mm -hmm. right? And so it just kind of evolved from there and, and, um, we just had Labor Day, right? A right. lot of Labor Day movements came because there were there were um, unions that were, bond, you know, kind of working together to say you're not going to be unfair right. to people, right? right? And it really kind of started with um, the Pullman Porters, mm. right? Mm. History. People, pe- people need to understand the history of Labor Day and all that. And Labor Day came about to say. Um, Labor, we appreciate you. Mm-hmm. Now, why we need a law to say that, I'm not sure. But fast forward, affirmative action is saying, well, clearly you're not getting this on right. your own. So we right. need rules and laws mm-hmm. that says if you're doing business with the federal government in particular, mm-hmm. right, um, because it comes largely out of the Office of Federal Contract Compliance and Programs, which mm-hmm. is ultimately under the Department of Labor, Um if you're doing business with the federal government, then we want to make sure that you are taking affirmative steps, like you said, affirmative steps to make mm-hmm. sure people have opportunities within your organizations, all people. Right. And oh, by the way, you're not discriminating on the basis of race, sex, gender, et cetera. Right. Right. Along comes diversity and inclusion that's saying, well, we know we want to diversify mm-hmm. the workforce. Mm-hmm. That's great. But we just don't want to have diversity right. of employees right. and then folks are just kind of sitting in the corner exactly. mm-hmm. being counted, right, but not being relevant. Exactly. And so I think in the in the late 80s, early 90s, there began to be this recognition mm-hmm. that we really had to move from just valuing diversity over into really leveraging mm-hmm. diversity mm-hmm. and leveraging inclusion. Mm-hmm. So taking an inclusive approach to everything that you do. Yes. And in affirmative action planning, if you still an organization that does business with the federal government, affirmative action planning is a part of your equation. Yeah. And actually, that's pretty much on in fundraising. That's on every application I have. To, right. It is. Uh, and that's a question I have to answer on every application, which and it's it's relevant. It, yes. It's does your organization have a discriminatory um, statement or process or, you know, do you discriminate based on X, Y, Z? Because if you do, <laughs> you cannot apply for these dollars. So I love that. Um, what are the benefits of a diverse and inclusive workforce? Innovation, creativity. Engagement, Mm -hmm. belonging. Mm -hmm. And if we do these things well, Mm -hmm. we should see less attrition, Mm -hmm. right? We should see a happier, more engaged, Mm -hmm. loyal workforce. More productivity. More productivity. 
more productivity. But it's not just diversifying the workforce. Mm-hmm. You really have to work at the inclusion piece. Mm-hmm. So I kind of get tickled sometimes when people say, I do diversity. And I'm like, well, what is that? How does that look? <laughs> How do you do diversity? Right? Right. Because, you know, if we just purely, you know, not try and be so academic about it mm-hmm. and just say, well, what is diversity? Mm-hmm. And it's just difference. Right. So how do you do difference? Right. <laughs> right. Right. So if we just talked about difference, right, and just said we're going to have difference in our workforce, right, right? Mm-hmm. of all kinds of things, things we know we can see and mm-hmm. things that we can't see. Mm-hmm. Right. People have different abilities and so forth. You don't know what my social and economic background was as part of my upbringing. Right. You don't know what my family, comp- you know, composition right. was. as part. Right. So those are some of the things that you can't see mm-hmm. in the workplace. Mm-hmm. But we're going to diversify the workplace. Now, right. what are we going to do with you? Right. Right. That's where inclusion comes in, which is about the full mm-hmm. utilization of mm-hmm. the talent, the experiences, the backgrounds that people are bringing in the mm-hmm. door. Right. And so companies spend a lot of money uh, recruiting for trying to find all of this great talent. Mm-hmm. You know, not a day goes by that I don't get some, you know, cold solicitation around having the perfect answer for diversifying talent. Mm-hmm. You know, the perfect answer for recruiting. Mm-hmm. I'm like, yeah, right. <laughs> okay, sure. Um, but it really gets back to what am I going to do with what you know how to do? Mm-hmm. And how can I leverage what you know, what you've seen, mm-hmm. what you've been through, your mm-hmm. perspective? How can I leverage that to help me as an organization make better decisions, mm-hmm. right? Expand my reach right. within my market base, right. help my customers and clients to better understand that I understand where you're coming from, right? I may not have all of the perfect answers to all of your challenges, but I do want you to know that I understand what you're coming from and I'm willing to learn more wow. about who you are and what's important to you. And mm-hmm. just as I want you to learn more mm-hmm. about who I am and what's important yeah. to me as well. Yeah, Because our experiences shape how we operate in the workforce and, and how we produce. Um, I'm, I'm in fundraising and working in social services, working in black and brown communities. My experience, how I grew up shapes, you know, how I interact with, you know, our community communities and, and, you know, really how I advocate on yes. behalf of our community, sure. you know, whether it's within the organization I'm working for or within the organizations or to the organizations I'm trying to solicit f- funding from. Yes. So our experiences shape how we operate internally in our organizations. So and in life and right? in life and our experiences also shape what we believe or understand mm-hmm. or believe to be true mm-hmm. or untrue. Mm-hmm. about people, situations, right, in general. So that would be a bias, something that people fear. Yes, yes. <laughs> but I'm, I'm here to declare <laughs> that we all have biases yes. because we've all been, you know, sort of peppered mm-hmm. with certain ideals, mm-hmm. certain concepts, cultures, norms, practices, mm-hmm. you know, traditions. We've mm-hmm. all been peppered with those things from the time we came into the world even down to what's on our birth certificate, Mm -hmm. in some ways that's kind of a marker of how you're going to be kind of raised as well. What you're going to be exposed to perhaps, what you're not going to be exposed to Mm -hmm. in general, right? You automatically go into a bucket, Mm -hmm. (laughs) right? So I strongly believe that if we can just accept the fact that as human beings with brains that function and part of that brain functionality is having an amygdala mm-hmm. that helps us figure out what we fear uh-huh. and what we are comfortable with mm-hmm. and understand that that leads us to biases. That yeah. leads us to preference and choice. Mm-hmm. Right. And we all have it. Right. If I go for pizza, says sausage or pepperoni, people are very, very clear yeah. about their choices around <laughs> things. Right. Yes. And so. You know, I think it's it's kind of short sighted to believe that we can divorce ourselves of mm-hmm. such of mm-hmm. such tendencies to yeah. prefer things when we come into the workplace. Yeah. It's going to follow you. The question is, is it running you or are you running it? Yeah, I'm glad you talked about biases. So. People have 
already an assumed perception of you. But we walk into an organization with some insecure, with our own insecurities. You know, coming from a black community, we have to be better. We have to work harder than our peers. We have to be perfect. And personally, I feel that has created within me my imposter syndrome Mm -hmm. because I'm walking into the office. I ain't got this fabulous job. I got this job through a networking opportunity Mm -hmm. and they sought me out. She pursued me. Mm -hmm. So obviously I'm qualified. I handed her my resume, but Mm -hmm. I walked in there feeling like I can't do this. I'm Mm -hmm. not good enough. I, I don't have the strategic thought process needed in order to lead this team and grow this team. And I would not quite sabotage myself, but I put myself on that track to sabotaging myself. Mm -hmm. And it's always with every new job I take, Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm not good enough. Mm -hmm. I'm not good enough. And I found through mentoring, um, I do mentoring with um, a women's philanthropic group. Um, So it's all women. Talking to other women, other women of color, Mm -hmm. they are having the same issues. Black and brown women are having the same issues. They And they're like, I'm so glad you put a name to it because I didn't know what was going on. I just felt like I'm struggling and I don't have what it takes to do this job. Mm-hmm. So how often do you see that? And I know it's not just women. I know men, you know, go through it as well. But how often do you see that and other barriers? It's interesting you, you asked that question, Tawana, because I probably see it more often than not. But that's no, not that's not mm-hmm. what I term it. Mm. Right. It's it can sometimes show up as she doesn't have her voice yet. Mm. Right. That's me. Um, She you know, she uh, she needs to build her confidence in different ways. Mm -hmm. Right. But here's where I say the starting point is. And you said it. I got the job because I earned the spot. Mm -hmm. Now, in the spirit of diversity and inclusion, if you got the job just because they wanted to have another other Mm -hmm. on the list, you need to figure that out. Right. Because they're not going to benefit you as an organization. Mm -hmm. Right. And you need to be very clear about that. So from the standpoint of I got the job because my background and experiences speaks to what this organization needs Mm -hmm. and what they believe I'm going to be able to fulfill. So the question is, how am I going to fulfill that? Mm. So I think a lot of times the imposter syndrome, as you term it, shows up because I don't have a game plan Mm. as to how I'm going to do this. You know, I enjoy watching sports. And the reason why is because you know what the rule book is. Yeah. And you know how you score. Mm -hmm. You know what a foul is. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know when Mm -hmm. you can be ejected. Right. (laughs) From competition, right? Unfortunately, the workplace isn't so clear cut. Mm -hmm. But if you think about the fact that on some level, everybody's playing by some kind of rules. Some Mm -hmm. are written, some are unwritten, Mm -hmm. right? So understanding more about where am I going in terms of this organization? Mm -hmm. What do I know about their culture? I mean, what's available to, to young professionals these days that I wish I had back in the day was you know, is things like LinkedIn. Mm. You can literally go in and not only see where people worked, but you can click into that, that brand, Mm -hmm, right. That icon, mm -hmm, and it'll take you to the company page and you can look a little bit more into what, what do they profess to be about? Yeah. And then you can find people who work there. Yes. LinkedIn just gives you that information, Mm -hmm. right? And I don't work for LinkedIn and I don't get any proceeds, (laughs) but, but it gives you all of this the, you know, this this treasure trove of information that you can explore to help you figure out where exactly am I going? Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So, so Tawana, if you and I were going to get together and take a glorious trip to the Bahamas, mm-hmm. if we packed a parka because I've got this nice looking coat that I want to take with me <laughs> and I get there, I'm going to look kind of stupid when I get there. Right. right. Not, not to mention no I'm just going to burn up. Because I didn't do my research, right? right? So that's a one big part, Mm -hmm. you know. And I like to say, act like you belong. Act like you've been there. Mm. Act like you've had the job that you're 
striving for. Mm. Not the one you have, right. but the one you're striving right. for. Now, what does it take to be, mm. what's the expectation of that next level? Who do I see in the organization that has been successful, perhaps at the level that I'm looking for? Who's been successful in the level that I'm in right now? What am I learning from them? Wow. I think a lot of times professionals of color in particular struggle with that. I'm not good enough mm-hmm. because we're very heads down. Mm-hmm. It's like you said, we were taught you got to work twice as hard mm-hmm. to be considered what? Half as good. Yes. <laughs> right. Yes. So if you think about it, I could go in defeated before I even started. Yeah. Right. Before yeah. I even got my badge. Yeah. If I really, really, really believe that. <laughs> right. So it's like, OK, well, if that's if that's the perspective, you know, I'm not going to change that perspective. Mm-hmm. But what I can do is. Figure out what my game plan is going to be to navigate. Yes. This organization to mm-hmm. find out what are some of those unwritten rules that I need to be aware of? Mm-hmm. What does protocol look like? You know, some organizations are still a little formal, Mm -hmm. right? If you look at how people Mm -hmm. dress, right? Yeah. So if an organization, if the if the industry and the organization that you're going into appears to be a little formal, you going in there with a completely different vibe, you might struggle a little bit. Yeah. I'm not saying don't do it. I'm just saying understand you might struggle a little bit, but at the core, Mm -hmm. I'm here because I earned a spot. Yeah. I'm here because I have something to offer and they know I got something to offer, right? The question is, how am I going to execute on that? How am I going to deliver on the promise as best I can? Yeah. The final thing I'll say is if they're not buying what you're selling, there's other buyers. Yes. There's other buyers, right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes we can get so tied to a brand Mm -hmm. that, wow, if I'm not a part of that brand, then... mm, you know, yeah. that that takes me to, you know, the B list or the C list or the yeah. D list or what have you. The fact of the matter is, if you work there, if you work there six months, you could still put that on your resume. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yes. You could st- you you did contribute on some level. Mm-hmm. So. I'm a person of faith mm. and I really believe in seed time and harvest. Mm. So everything that I did, even up until my first formal diversity inclusion role in 2006. Mm -hmm. Everything that I did was planting seeds, sowing Mm -hmm. seeds that I could draw upon as I harvest what I'm doing today and what I want to do tomorrow or what I need to do differently, you know, for an organization. Mm -hmm. That's a part of my own growth and journey. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I, I too mentor a lot of, um, young professionals, which I really enjoy. Um, and I, I say to them all the time, you got to stop and take stock of what you're bringing to the table. Yeah. yeah. You got to stop and think about that. That's why in sports, if it's a team sport, they got other people on the bench. People got different roles and you might have to come in and do something that you didn't know you had to do. Yeah. But you, right. <laughs> yes. Right. We yes. got to be willing to do that. Yes. We got to be willing to show up. Mm-hmm. Be in the space, smell the air, observe, mm-hmm. ask questions, mm-hmm. build relationships. Mm-hmm. Because the seventy percent of what I need to know to be successful, I'm going to learn from another person. Yes, and learn <laughs> while you're doing the job. Learn why? Because guess what? Everybody is, and I'm going to tell you very, very clearly, and I've seen it for myself. If imposter syndrome, as we, as mm-hmm. you know, it's termed, right, is a thing. Trust me when I tell you, white women have it, white men have it as well. Mm-hmm. It's just a matter of who overlooks it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Or who helps you get over it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so oftentimes, professionals of color, we are a little late in building our networks. And those are the people that can help us look past it yes. or get over it. Yeah. Or navigate I, I it. believe in building my network or as our good <laughs> friend Darius would say, our our personal board. Yes. I believe in that. I have people who are my mentors. Yes. They don't know they are. Yes. Right. I do too. <laughs> but I would call them and say, look, I have this problem and I would go on and explain it, but they're a VP and there is something that I can learn from that person. She's been a manager for 
many, many, many years where yeah. I'm just starting out. So yes. I have something to learn. Yes. But I believe in mentors. I When I realized my self-sabotage, mm-hmm. I had to take a step back and say, what are my issues? Mm-hmm. I'm in a completely different industry. I don't know half of what they're talking about. Mm-hmm. It's a huge organization. So what do I need? I mm-hmm. need to stop and I need to learn. Mm-hmm. I need to open my ears. I need to find someone who will take the time and teach me and mentor me. Mm -hmm. So I found someone in the organization to mentor me. And I'm lucky I have a great leadership team. My boss is, she's great. Mm -hmm. She's very supportive and she understands. Although she's always telling me, you need to find your voice. Mm -hmm. You know, stand on what you know. Mm -hmm. You know, your area of expertise and that will guide you. It doesn't matter. You don't know about conservation. You know about fundraising. So I've had to really um, depend on that, on my own expertise and and just try to go with it. And and I'm glad I'm making some good choices. At least I hope I'm making some good choices. <laughs> I'm sure you're making <laughs> fantastic choices. But you know what you're saying is you, you have to be clear with yourself, mm-hmm. right? And... Even asking yourself, what evidence do I have that supports what they're telling me Mm -hmm. that I'm off on? Is there evidence that supports that? And if there is evidence, let me backtrack on that and see what are the occurrences? What's the situation? What Mm -hmm. happened that led to that particular outcome? Right. And give me a chance to assess, reassess, readdress and do something differently. Should I be in that position again? Right. Yeah. So, so being clear with self is a very big part of, I think, not only um, surviving in an organization, but thriving in your career. Mm. You know, I am no one else, but Melissa B. Donaldson, period. End of story. I can't even try to fake something else. I love that. I love that. (laughs) But we are at the end of our show. And I just want to thank you so much, Melissa, for joining me today and talking all things uh, workforce development. Oh, most things workforce development. But join us next time on DIY DEI. I'm your host, Tawana Streeter. Thank you.